Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology, and for his daily Mormon history podcast. I'm Rick Bennett. We're continuing our conversation with Dr. Sarah Patterson, the author of The September 6th and the Struggle for the Soul of Mormonism. So get this and put it under your tree for your Mormon history friends. And we're going to talk this time about Sonia Johnson, Brent Metcalf, and uh, Mark Hoffman. Do they belong in the group of the September 6th? We'll also talk about some of the ultra-conservatives that were disciplined, including Abraham Gileadi. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other people. I was surprised in your book that uh, you even went back to Sonia Johnson. Mm-hmm. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Sonia Johnson, because, you know, they're not as old as, say, I am. <laughs> give, give the young people an idea of who was Sonia Johnson and why was she a problem for the church? Sonia Johnson was a church member who um, fought for the Equal Rights Amendment. And um, she talked about the Equal Rights Amendment. When she first heard that phrase, Equal Rights Amendment, she said something like, uh, the three most beautiful words in the English language. Um, So she really felt like the ERA was an important issue and that it didn't contradict her faith. Um, And so she was an activist for the ERA. She was one of the founders of Mormons for the ERA. Um, And she was eventually excommunicated for um, that work. And part of the reason that I talk about her is because the Equal Rights Amendment was one of the, I think, defining moments for the church hierarchy in terms of how it would talk about political issues. Um, so the church, what the church hierarchy said about the Equal Rights Amendment was, uh, it, more generally, excuse me, I should start there. More generally, it said, we're not going to get into political issues. But it framed the Equal Rights Amendment as a moral issue mm. and therefore said, we can absolutely say that this is a problem for society. Um, and so the church very actively worked against the Equal Rights Amendment um, once it had been framed as a moral issue. And so um, Part of what happened with Sonia Johnson is that church leaders started to frame feminism as an external kind of foreign movement that was trying to infiltrate the church. And church leaders um, narrated it as um, this is going to upset the family. And because we as the church care about the family, we need to protect the family. And the family needs to be um, a heterosexual union um, with the man being the provider and protector and priesthood holder and the woman being the nurturer um, and caretaker of the home and wife. And so their fear was that the equal... what they were saying was that the Equal Rights Amendment would upset that family structure because it would collapse the differences between men and women. Um, And then they talked about it as having this kind of snowballing effect. So if the differences between men and women collapsed, um, then divorce rates were going to go up children weren't going to be raised in a moral household, and so there would be more um, teen pregnancy and abortion. Um, Men would feel like they weren't men anymore, and so they might um, have affairs. Those affairs might be with other men. You know, so it was this much, it it was a snowball effect because they were arguing that the family was the foundation, right? And so basically the moral structure of society would crumble if the Equal Rights Amendment passed. Um, And so I think that was really, it was during that Equal Rights Amendment era that church leaders kind of got this, this, um, this theology 
um, framed that um, would then suit suit them well as they continued on into the 80s and 90s, um, talking about feminism as a danger to the church. Um, and once they were able to to make the claim that feminism was outside the church trying to get in, then they could also make the claim that they had to be the boundary enforcers, right? To try to protect the family. And so by excommunicating Sonia, they made her an outsider, <laughs> an right. outside threat. Right. Instead of an inside threat. Yeah. Um, and that excommunication really cast a chill over Mormon feminism, which was, um, a, you know, a really interesting, pe women were asking really interesting questions mm -hmm. about what their roles were, um, about um, the theology of the church. And Sonia Johnson kind of served as this lesson. Was she kind of the canary in the coal mine? That, that, I there, mean, there are certain things you shouldn't be doing and talking about. Because yeah. was she excommunicated in 1982? Does that sound right to you? I want to say it was 1979. Oh, was it 79? Yeah. So it was even earlier. Yeah. So because, you know, I remember th looking at that and saying, well, 79 to 93, that's 14 years. That's a big gap. But are, could we say that, I mean, even though Sonia, she's more focused on ERA, and you look at somebody like Maxine Hanks, um, Margaret Toscano, more of uh, more fem kind of feminist theology. Uh -huh. um, can we see Sonia as influencing them, and that's why they had to go after Maxine and Margaret and Janice and people like that? I think part of um, I, I I talk about Sonia in actually a chapter about the church hierarchy, and I think part of what I think was happening with Sonia Johnson and the Equal Rights Amendment is the church hierarchy was um, telling and reinforcing these narratives about feminism and about the family um, and developing um, strategies for um, working on political issues. Um, so when the issue of same-sex marriage came up later, the same thing happened in terms of we're going to frame this as a moral issue that's threatening the family, um, and it's and so therefore we can speak about a, what is a political issue, um, but framing it in a moral way. Um, and so I think all of that was kind of forged in that Equal Rights Amendment era, um, how the church was going to approach feminism, but also these issues that it wanted to frame as moral. Well, it's interesting you say that. I know there was a, I'm trying to decide if I should say the person's name. Uh, I'll just say a BYU professor for now. Okay. Keep it keep it generic. Um, that talked a lot about Sonia Johnson and uh, also the, the gay rights movement. Um, and that the church was always trying to say, well, if we allow feminism to influence the culture, gay rights is the next domino. Um, and as we look at Elder Packer's 19... 93. Was it 93? Yeah. So it was the same year. It was May 1993. May, because yeah. he said that the biggest problems were uh, feminists, intellectuals, and gays. Yeah. He didn't say it in those he words. He said but, gay lesbian movement. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the gay lesbian movement has always been tied to feminism as to create kind of a boogeyman. Um, I mean, I don't see Margaret... Uh, Janice, who's the other one I just mentioned, uh, the, the, to me, they were more feminist theologians. They weren't, they weren't looking at the politics, but the church always seemed to collapse them. And is that why hmm. they were seen as threats, even though they weren't pushing necessarily for ERA? Well, yes. I think that um, because they were feminists, because they... I mean, I, th I think they ha they share similarities, so I, I'll talk about them kind of together, but they mm -hmm. had different projects that they were working on. Um, I think Heavenly Mother was an issue that the church hierarchy clearly didn't want people exploring. Um, and so 
when Janice Allred, say, was exploring Heavenly Mother or when Margaret Toscano gave a presentation at BYU about the feminine divine, um, they were, they, the church hierarchy had already said this wasn't something that they wanted people talking about. They were women who were saying, I can talk about it and I can think creatively about how this theology might work. And so they were claiming a kind of spiritual authority that I think was threatening to the church hierarchy. Especially since they didn't hold the priesthood because they were women for right. heaven's sake, right? Right. And and you know Margaret was also talking about women in the priesthood. <laughs> and so I think that they were challenging um, they were feminists who were challenging um, what the church hierarchy set, had already drawn boundaries around. So just feminism's bad, whether it's in the political arena of ERA or theological re arena of Heavenly Mother or women and priesthood. Yeah. This is just, we can't have it. And part of what I think happened, which I talk about in my chapter about the Toscanos, is I think that um, Margaret and Paul had a marriage that was structured differently than the church expected marriages to be structured. And so... You know, here was Margaret, who was speaking with authority about spiritual matters. Um, and here was Paul, who was, you know, when they met with their stake president, he was unwilling to rein in his wife. And Can't you fact, get her under control? When after the local leaders, instead of, you know, reining after her his in, which, wife. Was, which, which I think was their expectation, right? We'll have them both here and then you know, they'll oh, stop. Oh, just put his thumb yeah, on her head. Right, and, right. Yeah. And so I think that um, while they were both making much broader arguments that were problematic for the church, they also were just not living up to gender expectations. And so I think that was really frustrating to the local hierarchy. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other people? So we've, we've talked about the six. Uh, we've we've added David Wright, Cecilia Farr, um, Gail Houston. Yeah. yeah. Um, Margaret technically wasn't part of the six. Right. Her sister Janice Allred. So that's we're we're up to like ten now, right? Right. You you keep trying to get me to I say know. a number. <laughs> I like, see, I'm a numbers guy. Did I'm we a add math Brent guy. Metcalf so. in there? Oh, Brent Metcalf. That was another one. I I was going to mention him. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Brent. Um. Well, he and was, by the way, Brent, you need to come on my podcast. <laughs> he had a collection of essays that came out, I think, in 94, mm -hmm. um, called New Approaches to the Book of Mormon. And it contained an essay by David Wright. Um, and it was a group of um, people studying scripture, many of whom are, were arguing that the Book of Mormon was not an ancient text. And so kind of the same set of issues that I but talked about But it still David, provides right? value. It's right. not like they were trying to knock it down as, as worthless right. or just fiction. Right. And, and that was, you know, something that in um, biblical, biblical studies, those arguments had been made for a long time that... Regarding that, the Bible. Re regarding biblical texts, absolutely. That you can read the text... Um, you, you can read that text as history, but scholars were arguing that it doesn't hold up in um, to historical criticism, but that there were a lot of scholars who were saying, but there can be lots of metaphors and meaning that can still be taken from the text. And this text can still be seen as inspired while also accounting for human hands in the text. Um, so... So in terms of um, scriptural studies, they weren't making cases that were new, but they were trying to help create a faithful approach to the Book of Mormon. Well, and Brent's especially interesting because he was in the crosshairs because he was from, he knew Mark Hoffman quite well. Right. <laughs> and so there was that whole issue um, where he 
was viewed as a suspect potentially in some of those murders. Uh, uh, clearly, he had nothing to do with them now. But at the time, in the, in the 1980s, that was a question. And then you said it was 94 when he publishes this new book. Was that kind of the straw that broke the camel's back? Do, do you talk much about the Hoffman stuff with Brent Metcalf? Uh, no, I talk about Brent Metcalf more with David Wright. Okay. Um, than in my section about Mark Hoffman. <laughs> um, but part of why I talk about Hoffman in the book is because I think that the events around him um, made church leaders um, aware of and anxious about history telling. Um, not that they hadn't already been, but I think um, what happened with Hoffman raised those questions in a new way. So can we conclude Mark Hoffman as part of the September 6th as well? No. <laughs> no, we cannot. <laughs> no, we cannot. He's, he's a whole other thing. When, when you get murdered, that, that kicks you out of the group. <laughs> um, who are some of the other people um, that you would put kind of in the broader September 6th category? Those are the names that initially spring to mind. Um, another issue that I talk about is um, the excommunications around the same time of ultra conservative church members. Okay. Um, and so part of what I'm thinking about in that discussion is Avraham Gileadi because okay. he's the he's the member of the September six that doesn't fit what I would see as more general patterns. And so I think that um, I think that his inclusion in the September six was about the fact that his excommunication happened that month, um, and and people wanted to communicate that this was you know a big deal that this was a really intense set of actions on the church leader's part, um, but Gileadi from the church leader's perspective was more connected to these ultra conservative members and he, his work was being used by them, um, to support the arguments that they were making. Are there others like Bo Greitz that we could include in there? Um, yes, not in the September 6th. <laughs> well, I mean, but in the broader movement. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Bo Greitz, Jim and Elaine Harmston, um, Sterling Allen. Okay. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed a conversation with Dr. Sarah Patterson, uh, the author of The September 6th and the Struggle for the Soul of Mormonism. So make sure you put this under the tree for your friends who uh, enjoy Mormon history. In our next and final conversation, we're going to talk about uh, whether intellectuals have changed uh, leaders' minds on certain topics, uh, intellectual topics. So you won't want to miss this conversation, but it's only available to newsletter subscribers. So go to uh, gospeltangents.com slash newsletter and sign up for our free newsletter, and I'll send you a secret link to the final part of our conversation where we're going to talk about this. So have the ideas that were presented by the six become, become more mainstream? mainstream. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, think, I think some of them have, and I think um, the historical arguments are probably one, the ones that have the most. Uh, as far as church history. Yeah, I think the role of the internet cannot be overplayed in that. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at gospeltangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on youtube.com slash gospeltangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at gospeltangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me for $100 a month, we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom and you can ask me anything you want. So thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, t-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up, up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents. 
and click here for some more videos.